Welcome back to Firex Techs. My name is Henry, and today I will be reviewing the Ambernick RG35XX H model, the horizontal sibling to the RG35XX Plus. The vocal store on Amazon was nice enough to send me this device to review. I am not receiving any payment for this video and will be sharing my unfiltered thoughts and opinions. If you want to get one for yourself, please check out the link in the description and that will take you directly to their Amazon store. First, I'm going to quickly go over what comes in the box. Obviously, the device itself with the 64 GB SD card, preloaded with games that I will show off later, wet and dry wipes to apply the included screen protector, a USB-C to USB-A charging cord, and the manual with some helpful information like setting explanations and a hotkeys list. Now for the specs, it comes with a all winner H700 CPU, a G31 GPU, one gigabyte of DDR4 RAM. The screen is 640 by 480 resolution with a size of 3.5 inches. And that is a four by three aspect ratio. It also has Bluetooth 4.2, Wi-Fi that supports both 2.4 and five gigahertz connections and dual stereo speakers. What all of this means is that the device should play everything up to PS1 and Game Boy Advance without any issues and still have a lot of room for fast forward speed, while also being able to play a good amount of Dreamcast, PSP, N64 with some graphical sacrifices. I will be showing the performance of these systems later on in this video. Now let's take a closer look at the device itself. It comes in three color options. This is the black version. Then there is also the transparent purple and transparent white. On the front, we have two analog sticks, the D-pad, start and select buttons, then the standard four face buttons. On the left side, we have the volume buttons, which double as brightness controls when holding the menu button. On the top of the device, we have the inline left bumper and trigger, the headphone jack, an OTG port, an HDMI out port, the charging port that can also be used for OTG, the function slash menu button, and finally the right inline trigger and bumper. On the right side, we have the power button and reset button. The reset button is recessed, so it should not get pressed by accident. On the bottom, there are the dual speakers, and then the main and secondary SD card slots. On the back of the device, it has two soft rubber grippy pads. So when you place this on a flat surface, it creates a small buffer and helps keep the back from getting scratched or the device from sliding around on smooth surfaces. They also help just a little bit, making it easier to grip and they do feel quite comfortable on your fingers. The shell is a matte plastic with almost a very slight texture to it, which I do like as it will not pick up fingerprints. The speakers are passable quality and can get decently loud without becoming distorted. However, it does have somewhat of a tinny sound and you will want to use headphones when you want to hear any of the lower notes of your game's music. I think the screen looks great. I have not had any issues with the viewing angles, unless you are looking at the screen from a diagonal direction, which I do not think most people would be doing. The four x three aspect ratio is great for the games that this device excels at. It does mean that it's not gonna be the best for PSP emulation, as it will have the black bars when using the original aspect ratio. Unless you don't mind stretching the screen, just don't tell me about it, as that does hurt my soul to hear it. The screen brightness range is okay. It can get bright enough to use outside, but depending on the game itself, you may have issues in direct sunlight, but in shade, it was easily visible. I do wish it could get dimmer for playing in a dark room, 
as the lowest brightness is still fairly bright to me. Now onto the controls. The four face buttons feel like the standard Ambernick buttons, which is a good thing. They use a rubber dome membrane connection and have a satisfying activation that you can really feel. When bottomed out, they always stay a little raised, so there's no fear of them getting stuck in the device, and you can feel where they are at all times. The same goes for the start and select buttons. The triggers and bumpers have a nice click and feel good to use. While not the loudest triggers I have heard, they are also not very quiet and will be heard across a quiet room. Right away, when I felt the D-pad for the first time, I noticed it felt slightly raised higher than I am used to, and a little stiffer even when compared to the Plus model. But shortly after using it for a bit, I could tell it was not going to be a problem, and then when I was engrossed in a game, I didn't even notice it anymore. Embernick did choose the correct layout for this device, with the D-pad above the analog stick on the left, as it is targeted for the older D-pad focused gaming systems, so I'm glad they did that. Some content creators like to do the Contra test to show if the D-pad struggles with false diagonals. A false diagonal is when you go to press one of the cardinal directions and you end up getting a diagonal instead. Contra is a good game to show this, at least for a baseline of how common it might be. The way this is done is by holding the down direction on the D-pad and rock your thumb back and forth, left and right. You want to see very little movement. However, as you can see on the screen, the character is moving quite a lot. Having the D-pad with frequent false diagonals can make it easier to perform certain special moves in fighting games, things that require a quarter circle or half circle input. However, it can make it hard or annoying to try to play games that require strict inputs where these false diagonals will interfere with it. When a device like this shows that it might have issues with false diagonals in the Contra test, I find that more testing is normally needed just to see how common it is. For this device, I played a good hour of the fan-made Tetris game, Apotris, trying to see if I ever got an accidental instant drop, which is the most annoying thing to get in Tetris. However, I did not experience that. One hour might not be the best test, but even when things sped up, I did not notice any issues with it. With Kirby's Dreamland, if a false diagonal gets registered in the up direction, Kirby will suck in the air to fly, which can be quite annoying when you're not trying to do this. However, after playing for a bit, I did not get any false diagonals unless I was actively trying to get them by moving my finger up and down. So what I think might be happening here is that the stiffness of the D-pad I talked about earlier could be helping counteract these false diagonals. However, with these systems, it's very common for each device to be a little bit different with how these buttons react, so you may have a different experience than I did. Now, onto the analog sticks. When I first saw this device, after having messed with the RG35XX+, Plus, I was pretty excited to see the analog sticks. I thought that it would allow the N64 to feel better, as trying to play with a D-pad was not something I was a fan of. Now, I'm sad to say that even though it is an upgrade than playing with a D-pad, it does fall short of being a great experience, as the sticks don't respond to slight movement and feel as if they have a huge dead zone set. As you can see, the input does not get registered until about 40% and then quickly goes from 40 to 100, which makes it very hard to control slight movements. So in N64 games, walking is almost out of the question. I double checked every dead zone setting just to make sure this could not be counteracted, and it really can't. I'm not sure if this is a hardware issue or a software driver issue, or even it could be an overreaction to try to prevent stick drift. I was hoping it was something that could be fixed with an update, however, I'm leaning towards this is probably a permanent issue. The other issue that I've noticed with the analog inputs is that they snap to one of the eight directions. So it's not a true 360 degree input, and this makes small adjustments difficult. This 
combined with the sensitivity issue, almost makes it feel like the analog stick is just mimicking a D-pad, even though that is not the case. I was unsure if it was just me who was experiencing this, as I didn't see a lot of other people talking about it. That is, until I saw the Retro Breeze video, where he has the same issues. Now, I do want to say, for games that don't require incremental analog input and work fine with the 8-way movement, so PS1 games, and especially arcade games, these are great to have. And I think one of the things that I love them being here the most is for Tate mode with the arcade. This has been awesome. I made a video on how you can set this up through RetroArch for a Mio Mini Plus, and it works well enough, but you have to use the back triggers for buttons, and it can feel a little awkward. This device though is light enough, and having the analog stick and buttons on the same side just makes it perfect. There's even a mode already set up in the game room specifically for this, so you can just give it a try. If you do want to do this in RetroArch, you will have to set it up yourself, which is fairly simple. You just have to enable the setting to allow the screen to be vertically flipped, and then remap the buttons and analog stick to be correct for this orientation. If you do go this route, don't forget to save the mapped controls and overrides. I would say this aspect alone makes it worth having the analog sticks on the device. Now, the size and weight of this device for being portable, I think it's great. It should fit into most pockets. The only issue I run into with these devices that have analog sticks is that the sticks will kind of grip to the sides of my pockets, making it take a little extra effort to get out of my pocket. Sometimes I worry that doing this too much might damage them. And I had the same issue with my RG405M. The fix that I found for that is I found a 3D printed front shell case that clasps on and it completely fixes this problem without adding any bulk or weight. What's great about it is you can also just flip it around and attach it to the back of the device when you're playing. And that way you don't have a case that you have to find a place to put down or put somewhere. The Etsy seller that I bought the case for the RG405M also makes one for the RG35XXH. I'll post a link in the description if you want to check it out yourself. Now, I find the stock firmware on this device passable and better than most stock experiences. It has all the basic things like favorites, history, search, some bare bones settings for changing themes, a way to remap buttons, brightness settings, connecting to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. It also has the beginner friendly game room for people who are not familiar with RetroArch or don't want to remember hotkeys. This allows them just to get into the game, bring up a simple menu for saving or loading states or anything else. But it does lack some of the customization for your emulation that is provided by RetroArch. And then you do have the option of running your games through RetroArch. This option allows you to use the hotkeys that are shown on the manual. And it's great for people who are either already know how to use RetroArch or who don't mind taking the time to learn to give you more options to fine tune the settings when running these games. Just a heads up, some systems will only be able to be launched from the RetroArch side, such as Dreamcast or N64, while some of the other things that they have already set up for you, like the vertical arcade, is gonna be located in the game room. Now the pre-installed games are listed alphabetically as they should be, but you'd be surprised how many stock firmwares get this wrong. So that is a plus on their side. The library of games that come with this device is not bad. If you are someone who does not have your own collection of ROMs, then this could be a good place to start. I will quickly kind of browse through some of them now, as you can see. It does not come with any N64 games and those will need to be added separately. Some features are missing that I like to see in firmware. Two of the largest ones for me are a built-in way to scrape ROM artwork. As you can see, most of the ROMs that come pre-installed already have artwork, which is nice. But when you add your own, or if you're using your own collection, it does save some time to have a way to scrape the artwork on the device itself. The other feature which is missing is the ability to be able to upgrade the firmware over Wi-Fi, especially when the update process for these devices are not very user-friendly and you have Wi-Fi on the system already. 
I have created a video for anyone who needs a walkthrough on how to update the stock firmware for the RG35XXH or Plus. And in that video, I also cover a modded version of the stock firmware, which does add some additional features such as FTP and upgrading over Wi-Fi. I will have a link to that in the description below. There are some promising custom firmware releases on the horizon. I will briefly go over a few of them now. I want to point out that as of the making of this video, these are in different levels of development, and I will be making separate videos covering each of these firmware options. The first option is Batacera. This is for people who either enjoy the emulation station layout, or for people who would like your firmware to look a lot better than the stock option. Even though this one is still in beta, it has made great improvements recently. It adds one of those main features that I was speaking about earlier, which is the scraping of artwork, along with some other great features. The only issues with it at the moment are there are still some bugs that need to be worked out and some optimization for the more demanding systems. Another option is MuOS. This firmware is unique as it's completely built off of a foundation of RetroArch, but has really evolved into something great. It has more of a minimalist UI compared to the flashiness of Batacera. However, it has plenty of really cool features that as of right now, a lot of the other firmwares lack. I won't go down the list of all of them right now, but one of the big ones is the ability to run Portmaster even though it is currently limited to the ARM HF ports. MuOS is probably the most stable of the bunch currently. The downsides to MuOS are right now, the standalone PPSSPP emulator is currently unavailable, but you can still run PSP games through RetroArch until it gets added. And it might take you a little longer to get everything set up just how you like it. But I do think that is worth doing as I really like this firmware so far. Last but not least is Garlic OS 2.0. This one, as of right now, is probably the least ready to use. However, it might be one of the ones people are looking forward to the most. Currently, it is in alpha state. I would recommend most people stay away from it, unless you're wanting to actively help the development team. Again, be on the lookout for my upcoming videos, going more in depth into each of these custom firmware options. Now I'm going to go over some of the performance of this device. The RG35XXH can handle everything up to and including PS1 and Game Boy Advance with ease and a lot of room for fast forwarding. So I won't waste too much time going over each of these systems, but I want to point out that these are the game systems that this device's main focus are on, and it does a great job doing it. The systems that I will be focusing on should be ones considered more like bonuses, as they can be hit or miss depending on the games you are trying. Starting with DS, I think it does great on most games. By default, frame skip is set to 1, and I think that is probably a good thing. For most people, they won't notice it. Some games, you can disable this and not have any issues, while others, you may get some audio stuttering. But I think it's safe to say that this device does a really good job with DS, at least in the performance aspect, as you will have to get used to the hotkeys of switching the screens back and forth, and it's nice that you can use the analogs to control the cursor. You do have to get used to hitting R2 to switch between screens, and L2 to show both screens at the same time. So, for any game that doesn't require a lot of touchscreen, this should do a pretty good job with it. Moving on to N64. N64 games, by default, really struggle, but this can be resolved by going to the Retro Arch menu and going down to the options and changing the GFX plugin to Rice. You will take a hit on graphic quality as you will notice more flickering and some of the lighting will look really odd. But without changing this setting, it's almost unplayable and with it on, it becomes a decent experience, at least with the frame rate. It's definitely not perfect N64 emulation, and with what I said earlier about the analog sticks not being very precise, some games you will kind of struggle to play. However, a lot of games will be playable, and it is a nice bonus for this device to have at this price point. Moving on to Dreamcast, 
a lot of the games that I threw at it, like Soul Calibur, Crazy Taxi, Jet Set Radio, ran great. Did not have any issues playing them, and I was quite surprised. Some things like Sonic Adventure 2 have noticeable slowdowns, and are not something that I would enjoy playing on, especially with the analog issues. But I could see other people getting by. Now for PSP, this is where I feel like you are really going to have to kind of pick and choose the games that can run okay on this device. Obviously things like God of War games are kind of out of reach, while other things like Gran Turismo and Persona 3 run fine. So I think the RG35XXH does a great job with these more demanding systems for the price. Again, I would not buy this device specifically to play these systems, and you would just want to look at it as like a nice bonus, and it's nice to have them as an option. So all in all, I think this device is in a really good place. The more time that I spent using it, the more it grew on me. Now, I like the nostalgic vertical Game Boy form factor of the Plus model, but with it being so similar to the Mio Mini Plus, and with Onion OS being such a great custom firmware, it was hard for me to recommend the Plus model over a Mio Mini Plus. But now with the RG35XXH model, it really has carved out its own spot for itself by having the comfort of a horizontal device, the addition of the analog sticks, even with their issues, and being small, lightweight enough to fit in your pocket, and to have enough power to run a lot of systems for a device of this price range. The stock OS is not something I would celebrate, however it is usable and I would say passable for most users. With a lot of options for custom firmware starting to be available, the device is only going to get better over time, and I think it really is a great option for people who want to get into a budget handheld that focus on retro games and would like to have the horizontal aspect and analog sticks. All right. That about covers everything I wanted to go over with the RG35XXH. If you have enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content like this. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching.